In this episode of Careers That Matter, I'm joined by James Donaldson, the CEO of BC Food and Beverage. James, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Stuart. What does the CEO of Food and Beverage do? I was hoping you could tell me. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting. So we're a nonprofit industry association. So, you know, we have membership. So uh, my job's definitely evolved over the years. I've been in the role for 10 years now. Um, you know, the most important part that I play is one is I sort of set the strategy and, and I'm responsible for the financial uh, sustainability of the association. Um, those are pretty big responsibilities, but we also, um, you know, I'm also really uh, important role of being an advocate for industry. So, you know, talking to members, listening to them, understanding what their issues are, um, and then trying to turn those problems into, you know, solutions and opportunities and kind of advocate to other industry groups, other sector groups, um, you know, even retailers uh, and government at the provincial and the federal level and sometimes municipal level. So, um, but, you know, as, as an association, we try to build, you know, programs, resources and tools and everything's built off of what we keep hearing from membership. So I play that role uh, and also just how do we identify, how do we turn those needs into resources that help them? So fortunately, I have a team to help me with a lot of that, but, you know, a lot of it kind of sits with me and making sure that we can do it and remain viable and sustainable and pr provide the level of support to our members that they need. How many members and what sectors do they come from? Well, we've got several hundred members. Uh, most of them are quite small. You know, the industry in BC is really driven by entrepreneurship. So what 90% of the businesses and, and that are food and beverage manufacturing are small. Uh, we have the full gambit. We have right from startup all the way to the biggest companies in BC. We have craft breweries, we have poultry companies, we have dairy, we have natural health products, we have coffee uh, and everything in between. So it's, it's sort of a full mix. And of course, we can't be an expert on every subsector, but we, you know, we try to we try to really focus on the eighty percent that that makes them all the same, as opposed to the the parts that make them all unique. So, you said you have a team. How, how big is your team, and what kinds of responsibilities? Do so they there's have? there's eight of us. Um, we have sort of you know Alisa Hutton. She's our COO. She's kind of my right hand and, and drives a lot of the programs, and and we do a lot of big events because we try to build community and bring industry together. They they don't have to figure it all out for themselves, and they also aren't the usually very rarely are the first people to ever be going through um, going through the experiences that they're having. So bringing people together, there's a lot of power in that. So we have, a, you know, we do a lot of big events. Uh, and then we have an, an event team, you know, an accounting person. We have a, a marketing person. We have a, a community manager who does all of our social media and does a lot of storytelling. There's a lot of power in, in members hearing other members' stories as well. So, yeah, so we kind of build all of that out and we do a lot of different programs and projects. So as a small group and a nonprofit, everyone kind of wears a few hats. Uh, but uh, but it's a, it's, it's a team effort, but everyone's kind of really passionate about what they do, which is makes it fun to work oh, with. So about eight people or yeah, so? Yeah, there's eight of us, yeah. Oh, that's a nice manageable uh, group, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yes, nine years ago it was just me, so it's definitely nice. I, I always uh -huh. like to joke that, you know, I, I at, at one point I've done all of their jobs, they all just do it way better than I ever did, so. <laughs> so what does an average day look like for you? Um, well, it's, it, it changes a lot, and I don't think I've ever had a dull moment uh, in, in the time I've been in the role, but uh, quite often it's, you know, I have a lot of meetings with, with government, a lot of meetings with members, a lot of meetings with a team on, on things that are going on. Um, you know, we administer some different programs. They're always kind of making sure that we're, we're on top of those, making sure that the content is relevant. Um, always having a scan to, you know, to the news, are there any key things that are coming up that are going to impact our members negatively so we can kind of communicate that to them. And then managing the communication is very important. There's, you know, with a very large diverse membership, we can't just be blasting every time we see something, we have to kind of manage it and put it together in bite-sized pieces. So, so just kind of working with the group to make sure that they're on top of, of what they're doing. Fortunately, I don't have to do that too often because I've got a pretty talented group um, and Elisa handles a lot of that for me, which is, which is terrific. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really um, setting up those meetings and, and talking to industry leaders, talking to our members, talking to government. Um, that's kind of the biggest part of what I do uh, most days, actually. Well, yeah, but I know that you uh, are panelist or MC events and also appear on shows like this one. That's, so that's, that's a true. part of uh, your role as well, being the outward face of the uh, organization. Yes, that's yeah. that's true. Uh, yeah. That's something that sort of, I don't know if I've ever been super comfortable with it, but I've yeah. grown accustomed to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, uh, our industry, it's such a big industry, but so few people know about it. So I think it's really important that, that you know, the, the more we can be externally facing when it makes sense 
to sell, you know, play a bit of an education role. We're, we're not what I would call consumer facing. Like our primary focus is working with our members and working with industry um, to help them with their problems. But you know, in times like this, when when uh, you know there's different challenges going on in the industry, and we think that there's some benefit for you know a, a wider audience to understand the, the 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 challenges and the implications of those challenges, then yeah, we sort of play a more externally facing role. Well, let's talk about your career path, because sure. to wind up as CEO of BC Food and Beverage, I'm sure you don't go to a school to say, yeah, I want to be the CEO of BC Food and Beverage uh, when I grow up. Um, Where did you get started? Yeah, well, funny question. Um, yeah, I, I actually started, I, I graduated, I grew up born and raised in Winnipeg, and I graduated from the University of Manitoba, um, got my degree in economics and and didn't really have a plan. And I moved to Vancouver. My sister moved out here and encouraged me to try something different. And uh, I decided I would give it six months. And my first job was selling fax machines on commission. So um, fax machines. After, yeah, after going to university, wow. you remember those? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. H half of my half of our 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 staff has probably never used a fax machine. So it's always kind of funny sharing that story. But um, yeah, so I start I started there for worked there for about a year and a half and. Um, yeah, I sort of, I didn't want to go back to school, but I really didn't give me a lot of clarity in terms of what I wanted to do. Although I knew that, you know, commission, commission, a uh, life of commission sales was not for me. Some mm -hmm. people can do very well at it, but it was not for me. Um, and then I actually ended up um, in the food industry working for Diageo, which is a big beverage alcohol company and started off, um, you know, in, in sales. But I really learned my you kind of need to learn about yourself. It's really more learning about yourself and what motivates you as you kind of start your career path. And I found out I was I was a real strategic thinker and I was very analytical. So looking even as a salesperson, I was always sort of able to use those tools to find opportunities. And uh, and then it went sort of from there, it was getting involved in category management and profitability analysis, like working with the BC Liquor Board. And a lot of it was just sort of those skills that I didn't really know that I had. but. You know, you don't learn them in school necessarily. You have to kind of wade out into the universe to kind of start to, to, to see how you're going to be effective. And then you start to figure out how to leverage those tools and then look for those opportunities that, you know, that, that can advance those skills if you're good at them and, and, and hopefully if you enjoy them as well. So what were the most important uh, roles that you had that led to you being in a position where you were the ideal candidate mm -hmm. for your current job? Yeah, well, I'd say, you know, I had some really progressive roles. I kind of started in, in junior roles. I worked for East Veggie Cuisine as sort of a marketing analyst, a pretty junior role. Um, then I moved to BC Hothouse and I was marketing manager and we went through quite a, quite a dramatic change there and, and I had to really step up and play a bigger role and, and, uh, and ended up being promoted to director of marketing and was there for a while. And that was really where, you know, I kind of really started to see how my skills could apply to leadership. And then that became sort of a, a focus of mine. I wanted to sort of look at where I could ap apply the strategic skills. The analytical skills were great, but then I really wanted to apply the strategic knowledge. So I was director of marketing there for a few years. And at that, it was at that point that I realized that I never really had any formal training in business. You know, I got my economics degree, but other than that, it was pretty much just learn as you go. Seat of the pants. It's, yes, yeah. to a certain degree, yes. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, and I had some great bosses and I had some great work environments, so I did, definitely learned a lot and I brought all that forward. I think that's the most important thing. You don't leave stuff, you just bring it forward. Even the bad experiences you can learn from. Um, and then I went and worked for Maple Leaf Foods for three years and was their director of marketing. And they had a lot of leadership training. And I was really able to kind of start to formalize uh, my, my leadership skills. I think when I first moved into a leadership, I felt like uh, I had to have all the answers. And I realized it's actually quite the opposite. It's, it's, it's about having the courage to, to say you don't know, uh, be, be curious, ask questions, and, and don't be afraid to, to admit you don't know, but just be sure you can go and find the answer or have someone uh who you work with who does so um and, and then from that i ended up uh, moving that into a general management position of a startup and was there for a couple of years and and then that was around 2008 2009 and the interesting thing as i mentioned you know before the, the food industry it's a lot of small companies so what i found is i was kind of ready for a real leadership position and most of the smaller businesses you know the the, the leader is also the owner so those yeah. those opportunities don't grow on trees and at that time, I actually started consulting, and I because I found you know I can apply that strategic insight, my analytical abilities, and then the, the past experience, and help help different clients. So I really started specializing in the food space, and it was because of doing that I met several members of 
of our association's board and, and, and had relationships with them. And then when the op this opportunity came available, it sort of became this natural extension of kind of what I was already doing, kind of helping helping clients sell all, every day. And it was just helping through a different lens and it didn't have any nonprofit experience, but they wanted someone who had an industry background. And, I, and fortunately, because I'd worked for big companies and small, I had a, a unique and broad perspective. And that was about 10 years ago now. So you talked earlier about having self-awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think would be one of the one or two top uh, traits that you possess that allowed you to see your career continue to grow and progress to the point where you are today? Well, I know it, it probably sounds a bit cliche, but I, I, I've always prided myself on my work ethic. And um, I don't think I'm the smartest guy and I don't think I'm the, the most talented guy, but I, you know, I work really hard and um, you know, I, I always made it, try to make sure that, that things are done well. And I think that's really kind of helped me overcome. You can be talented and not work that hard and you're only gonna get so far. Like it's still a matter of kind of what you put into it. And I, I will say though that, you know, the food industry was, has been an exceptional journey for me because I didn't realize, I, I left it briefly um, for about a year. And as soon as I left the food industry, that's when I realized how much I missed it and how that I, I was met there. So if you can find uh, a path that you're passionate about, like I haven't, I haven't not been motivated to work one day and that might sound corny, but I, you know, I, I, I love the job and I feel, always feel motivated to support our members. I always feel motivated to make sure I'm supporting the rest of the team. Uh, so, so I think that kind of finding something that you're passionate about, everything becomes easier when you do that. But there's no substitute for, you know, showing up, working hard, being an active listener. Uh, and and uh, it's not a very uh, sexy or scientific formula, but it's, it's, it's done pretty well for me. And, and I would definitely, and, and I'm very proud of the fact that the work ethic has been instilled in our kids and they're all doing quite well and they all work very hard and, and, uh, and, and they're all seeing success up from that too. So I know that it's not just me. <laughs> well, it's not just you. As you're saying that, I'm reminded of Arnold Schwarzenegger's Five Secrets to Success. And he said, you know, go out and have your vision, uh, set aside the naysayers. But once you've uh, locked on to what it is that you want to do, work. Yeah. Like, work, 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 work. And he's a perfect test to the man, testament to that as you are. So yeah, it's and it's true. And, and it's so true. And, and don't be afraid of the dirty work. Don't don't ever think that any work is beneath you. Uh, I think that's sort of one of the one of the things that I see from time to time and think, you know, that's not my job anymore. You know, I'll like I'm CEO, I'll take out the garbage, I'll, yeah. I'll sort the recycling, I'll clean the sink, like what like those things that need to get done. It's not somebody else's job. Like it's about taking personal accountability for your workspace and, and, and just taking pride in everything you do. And uh, like I said, I know I probably sound old now by saying by, by making that comment, but mm -hmm. I, I just I believe in it so firmly and, and I don't think you'll people will always respect you more if you're willing to, 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 to do the, the dirty work. Well, you don't sound old. You sound like an inspiration. Thank oh, you very much. Thank, <laughs> thank you for giving us a, a glimpse into your uh, role and your path to your uh, success in oh, life. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Stuart.